Jesus name and again everybody said amen we're in a series right now called the road to the anointing the road to the anointing and I'll just give you a, a little recap of the series we're going to be in week number three today but week one we talked about how Elisha was called by Elijah to carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit and Elisha leaves everything behind to follow Elijah for the rest of his life and we use this uh, cloak and I'm not going to put it on because last time I put it on somebody took a picture of me and posted it on Facebook <laughs> it was my birthday and they got a picture of me in this, and I don't even know what I was doing a while back, but I had like this floaty thing around my waist that you would take to the pool, and those are the two pictures that they chose to post for my birthday. Happy birthday, Pastor. We have these embarrassing photos of you. So I'm not going to put it on anymore, <laughs> but we talked about it, and Elijah comes by while Elisha is in the field. And we talked about everything that that meant and everything that it represented and what it meant that Elisha was going to have to get up. But he takes his cloak off that represents what? It represents the call and it represents the anointing. It represents the position and it represents the power. And he took it off and he drapes it across Elisha's back, doesn't even stop walking. He just hits him in the back with it and he keeps on walking. And what does Elisha do? He says, hey, I want some more of that. I've never felt anything like that, and I can't, I, after I've felt it, after I've experienced it, I can't go through life not experiencing that. So I'm, he makes a commitment on that day. I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to follow that anointing, and I'm going to follow that power all the way up until it's my time to take hold of that power. Elisha leaves everything behind, his family and his farm and everything behind, and he follows Elisha. He commits to follow Elijah for the rest of his life. We talked about what is the anointing. Something that I want you to remember. What is the anointing? The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit that makes you better than you are. The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit that makes me better than I am. I'm, I know that I'm not that good. You know that I'm not that good. If you have the anointing, you know you're not that good. People looking onto your life, they'll know that you're not that good, but you're still getting these amazing results. Why? It's the supernatural power of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. What is the anointing? It's the power of the Holy Spirit. It makes me better than I am. Last week, we took our first stop at Gilgal. What happens at Gilgal? Gilgal is the place of separation. Separation from what? Separation from our flesh. At Gilgal, there's some cutting back of flesh. Gilgal is a, is a painful place, but it's a necessary place on the road to the anointing. Last week, we said that Gilgal, in Gilgal, we were separated from our flesh, but we're also separated for a specific purpose, and that's more what we're going to talk about today. Let's get into it. 2 Kings 2, verses 1 through 3. 2 Kings 2, 1 through 3. This is the last day of Elijah's life here on earth, and Elijah's following him to their final destination, and this is what it says, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. We talked about that last week. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elisha said, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Verse number three, the company of the prophets at Bethel came out to Elisha and asked, do you know that the Lord is going to take your master from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied, so be quiet. Have you ever longed for a season to come to an end, only to be sad when you knew that it was only days or moments away from being over? Maybe that's just me, and parenting it, it just teaches you so much 
uh, about your parents, like, I have a whole new perspective on my parents, a whole new love. Like, my parents are so much smarter than I thought they were, like, even five years ago. Like, I, st I still didn't understand uh, the wisdom that my parents had. But we went through the boys' rooms this last weekend, and we got rid of some uh, toys that they had outgrown, and we got rid of some clothes that didn't fit anymore. And that stuff just brought back memories from when the boys were little and those toys were just right because they're little boy toys and that's what you should still be playing with and those clothes fit just right because they're little boy clothes and you should still be wearing those little boy clothes and we were going through toys and I said you know Judah do you do you want this or do you want to get rid of it and he said ah, I want to get rid of it and it just it began to crush me because I could go back to these moments when that toy was everything and that's what he loved to do and I, I can remember moments that we had with those things and so I may or may not have kept some of his toys <laughs> I thought back to those times when they were little and sometimes during those seasons when they were little I got to be honest with you, it's not something I'm proud of, but it's just the truth. Sometimes I was wishing that those seasons would be over because of the hassle that those seasons brought along with them. And now that they're getting ready to be over and in some regards are already over, I'm, I'm missing the last season a, a little bit. And I wonder if that's how Elisha felt in our text today. He longed for the day when he would wear the anointing again. I, I, you never convinced me that he forgot what it was like to feel that anointing rub across his back. And so he's been following after Elijah, and he longed for the day when he would wear the anointing. He longed for the day when he would feel what he felt in that farm field, and not just feel it for a moment, but he would possess it. But in getting closer to the end of the season, that he was walking under the anointing and the protection of someone else, and he's not really excited about it if you see his conversation that he has with the prophets in verse number 3. <clears throat> he left his home. He said, I'm going to follow you, and I'm going to follow the anointing. And By this point, he had probably followed Elijah for about six years. The prophets in Bethel say, hey, this is about to be over Elijah's about to be taken away, and instead of Elisha being excited because he was about to get to possess what he had wanted to possess for years, he doesn't really want to talk about it. He doesn't really want it to be over, and I actually think that that goes to show us something about living a life in the anointing. Before I can carry the authority of my own anointing, I have to honor the spiritual authority that God has placed over me. Before I can carry the authority of my own anointing, I have to learn to come under authority. For years, Elisha had followed. When Elijah said, go to Gilgal, there was no discussion about it. There was no argument over. Elisha followed. When he said, it's time to go to Bethel, Elisha followed. To Jericho, Elisha followed. From the farm field to the Jordan River and everywhere in between, Elisha proved that he could faithfully follow. He proved that he would be faithful over the small things so God could entrust to him the more weighty things. And I think a lot of people miss out on the anointing because they miss stops on the road that we're talking about right now. And I think that they miss stops on the road because they're trying to blaze their own trail instead of finding and following a dedicated, faithful, honorable leader who has gone before them and already knows the way to the anointing. And if you find the right leader, they're going to take you on the road to the anointing. They're going to take you on the road to your own anointing. And that road has to go through our stop today. That road has to go through Bethel. Once again, what does Elijah say to Elisha? You can stay here if you want. You don't have to conquer this. You don't have to conquer Bethel. But Elisha made a commitment to follow this man of God and pursue the anointing of God. And he wasn't going to give up at the last minute. So what do they do? So they go to Bethel. What's the spiritual significance? We looked at this uh, last week with Gilgal. So let's look at it again. What's the spiritual significance of Bethel? What would Elisha 
needed to have gotten. Why did Elijah feel the need to go to Bethel? What did he need to teach Elisha before he could pass down the anointing? What's the spiritual significance of it? Well, we find the the naming of the place of Bethel because it was called something else before. It was called Luz, which Bethel is a... Can we all agree that Bethel is a way better name than Luz? Like, if my town was named Luz, I would be inviting people to come and rename it. And so that's what happens. We find it in Genesis 28, verses 10 through 19. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and laid down to sleep. And he had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its, tops re with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Verse number 13. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. So what happens? Jacob meets with God. God extends the promise that he had given to his grandfather Abraham. He extends it down to Jacob, whose name would later be changed to Israel. So he extends it down to Israel, and he says, I am going to make a great nation from you. And when Jacob wakes up, he knows that he has met with God. He knows that he's been in the presence of God, and so he names the place Bethel. Why? Because Bethel means house of God. <clears throat> Bethel means house of God. God. Now, as much as I would like to take today's message and make it about uh, church attendance, and as much as we need uh, good biblical teaching on the subject, when we talk about Bethel being the house of God, we're not talking about a church building. We call church the house of God, and certainly it, it is the house of God. And, and the temple in the Old Testament, and all, all, that was the house of God. But when we talk about our Bethel, that we have to go through Bethel on this road to carrying the anointing. When we talk about Bethel, we're, we're not talking about a church building being the house of God. We're talking about you and your dwelling in the house or in the presence of God. Jacob wasn't in a church when he met with God. So I started doing some thinking. And you know what? Noah wasn't in a church when he met with God. Abraham wasn't in a church when he met with God. Moses wasn't in a church when he met with God. Saul wasn't in a church when he met with God. Peter, James, and John weren't in church when they met with God. The Ethiopian eunuch wasn't in church when he met with God. Adam and Eve met with God in a garden. If you like to garden, maybe your Bethel is in a garden. It's biblical. David met with God. He wasn't in church. He was in a sheep field, on a battlefield, and in the valley of death. Jacob met with God in a field. Jonah met with God in a well. Esther met with God in a palace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego met with God in a fire. Daniel met with God in his home and then again in a lion's den. Lazarus met with God when he was dead and in a grave. Saul met with God on a road. Peter met with God on a boat. Now, I'm for church. 
Don't get it twisted around this morning. Don't take what I'm saying and say, Pastor said we don't have to go to church to meet with God. That's not what I'm saying. But where in Scripture do we pull from Holy Scripture? Where do we pull that the main place that we're supposed to meet with God is in church? If you're only meeting with God in church, you're not meeting with him enough. If you're only meeting with God in a public setting, you're not meeting with Him enough. If you're only hearing from God through my mouth, you're not hearing Him enough. If you're only experiencing worship when our worship team leads you into the presence of God, you're not worshiping enough. Bethel can be in this building but it can't be only in this building. The house of God, the presence of God, what it really means is this is my secret place with God. This is my quiet place with God. Can you have that here? Yes, but you can't only have it here and walk in the anointing at the same time. We meet with God at our Bethel, the house of God. is wherever we meet with Him. Maybe your Bethel is in your car. Maybe it's in your bedroom. Maybe it's in your office. Maybe it's on your, in, on your back porch. Wherever it is, your Bethel is wherever you meet with God. Jacob met with God and named the place House of God. Then several years later, he went back to Bethel to meet with God. But this time, he called it something different. He, he just liked to rename things. I don't know if it's because he got a new name, but he just wanted to rename it. And so he actually called it something just slightly different. First, whenever he went there and he had a dream and he met with God, he called it Bethel, the house of God. Then he goes back later to meet with God again. This time, though, he doesn't just call it Bethel. Do you know what he calls it? He calls it El Bethel. El Bethel, watch this, means God of the house of God. Could it be that Jacob had grown in the Lord and realized that the emphasis wasn't on the house of God, but was on the God of the house? Our emphasis can't be on the place where we meet with God. I don't care where it is that you meet with God. What's important is that God is there and you're meeting with him consistently. Get to your Bethel. If you want to walk in the anointing, you have to have a Bethel. You have to have a place where you get alone with God, a secret place, a quiet place that's just between you and God. What do we do in Bethel? In the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant that represented the presence of God was kept for a long period of time. All throughout the time of the judges, the, the Ark of the Covenant was kept in Bethel. And then there were some military struggles, and eventually David brought it to Jerusalem, but during the time of the judges, again, the Ark of the Covenant, so the presence of God on earth was in Bethel. So when people wanted to inquire of the Lord, where did they go? They went to Bethel. Well, how is that significant for us? When they wanted to inquire of the Lord, where did they go? They went to the house of God. They went into the presence of God. So what are we supposed to do in our Bethel, well, there are an abundance of things that we can do. There are an abundance of things that we should do. There's no way we can cover all of them today, but I do want to talk about just a couple of them. And the first one is just that. In our Bethel, we inquire of the Lord. In Judges 20, we see this. The Israelites went up to Bethel to inquire of God. They said, who of us shall go first to fight against the Benjamites, and the Lord replied, Judah shall go first. They had a decision to make about going into battle, and how do we need to attack? And instead of making it based on who the strongest fighters were, or who, which tribe had the most people, or which tribe had the biggest army, or the, the best strategy that the commanders could come up with, what did they do? They went to the presence of God, and they asked God. They inquired of the Lord. Where did they do it? In Bethel, in the house of God. 
Our Bethel time is a time when we should inquire of the Lord, God, what is your will for my life? Should I take this job? Should I date this person? Should I buy this house? Should I go to this school? Should I develop this relationship? We have to get this right because we can only walk in the anointing when we're walking in step with the Spirit. It is, after all, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about that every week, and we will continue to. We can only walk in the anointing when we're walking in step with the Spirit, and we can only be in step with the Spirit when we're consistently going to our Bethel and inquiring of the Lord, God, what do you want me to do? And so often we get this backwards. We decide what we want to do, then we go to Bethel, and we say, God, will you bless what I want to do? I made the decision. It all makes sense. I can make so much more money over here. This is all great. So, God, I want you to please bless me in this. That's our prayer. On the way to the new job, God, I hope you bless my day today. We've got it backwards. First, we go to Bethel and say, God, is this what you want? Because if that's not what you want for me, then I don't want that thing. But we get it twisted around. And we ask God to bless our plans instead of asking God to reveal his plans to us. We have to go to Bethel consistently and inquire of the Lord. What's something else that we can do in our Bethel? We get encouraged by the Lord in our Bethel. 1 Samuel 30, David was greatly distressed because the men were talking of stoning him. That's what the text says. Each one was bitter in spirit because of his sons and daughters. But David found strength in the Lord his God. It's a longer story, but the short of it is that David led his men into battle, and while they were gone out to battle, uh, a, another raiding army came in, and they burned the city down, and they took all of their wives, and they took all of their children, they took everything that they had, and now the people who were following David into battle have turned on David, and they've decided that they wanted to kill him. This is why personal Bethel is so important. David did not have anyone else that he could turn to. All his family was gone. All his friends were angry with him, very angry with him. And so if David didn't know how to get alone with God, it would have ended him. But he knew how to get alone with God. He knew how to go to the secret place. He knew how to get alone with God in his Bethel. So what did he do? So he found encouragement. And there, there's a text, and it preaches real preachy. And so a lot of people like to say, David encouraged himself. And he did. He was alone. But man, that'll, that'll just go. When everybody turns their back on you, you just go encourage yourself. That's not what the text says, though. It says he encouraged himself, how? In the Lord. In the Lord. In the presence of the Lord, he encouraged himself. Where was he at? He was at Bethel. I mean, he was in Ziklag. That's the name of the place where they were. But he was in Bethel. He was in the house of God. He was in the presence of God. David knew what we have to know he knew how to get alone with God and find encouragement there from the Lord and so many believers walk around discouraged living from Sunday high to Sunday high because they don't have a personal Bethel they don't have a place to go on Thursday when life hits them in the mouth and they don't know what else to do they don't know how to go get alone with God in the secret place and alone with God in the quiet place and encourage themselves where in Bethel encourage themselves in the Lord so they live these distracted detracted lives until they can get back to church again and get some word and get encouraged Bethel will encourage you I don't know about you guys. I need to be encouraged on the daily. Okay. Maybe y'all's lives are just like so much smoother than mine. But I'm just telling you, if I go a day or two, 
without going to Bethel? My family knows it. My wife can tell me, and she will. You need to go talk to Jesus. You need to go get along with the Lord. And I know it. Why? Because whenever I miss my Bethel time, I'll get discouraged more easily. Why? Because it's in my time with God. It's in the secret place. It's in the quiet place when I meet with Him alone that I'm encouraged in Him. What else happens in Bethel? Everybody brace yourselves. We get corrected by the Lord in Bethel. Part of your Bethel time has to be in the Word of God. And the Word of God will often bring correction. And the Word of God will often bring training. 2 Timothy 3, verse number 16 says, All Scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. We talked about this last week, but if we're going to walk in the anointing, it's going to be a righteous walk. We learn about righteousness through our time in the Word of God. The Word of God should be a part of our daily Bethel time. There are things in people's lives that God wants to deal with. There are things in your life that God wants to correct, and He wants to change it. And He doesn't want to change it because He's angry with you. He wants to change it because if you don't go to Bethel and you don't allow Him to change it, eventually when you get the position and eventually when you get the anointing and you haven't fixed that thing that God wanted to fix in Bethel, eventually that thing will destroy you and it'll destroy your ministry and it'll destroy the anointing and it'll destroy the position and the calling that God has on your life. If you don't believe it, just Google ministers that have failed and read for hours why they had the anointing certainly they did God used them certainly he did they had the position and they had the platform but what somewhere along the line they stopped going back to Bethel somewhere they stopped going back and getting correction from God And they would tell you, why did you stop going and spending time with God? Many of them will tell you. Because every time I went to spend time with God, he wanted to talk about this thing. And I didn't want to talk about this thing. And so I stopped showing up. Why do you think he wanted to talk about that thing? Not to be angry with you, because if you had allowed him to deal with that thing, then your life wouldn't be destroyed right now. And your ministry and all the people who are following you, their lives, all of that stuff that God wanted to do for the kingdom, it wouldn't be destroyed right now. If you had let God deal with that thing when it was in infancy in your time in Bethel. God wants to correct you in Bethel. But you got to go there. You got you got to go there. You got to listen to him. You got to get in the word. You got to spend time in prayer. You got to spend time talking to God. You got to spend time listening to God and you're going to have to spend some time changing. You get so many more things during your private time at Bethel. There's no way we could talk about all of it today. The secret place with God. You find freedom in Bethel. 2 Corinthians 3 said, says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there, in that place, that's where freedom is. Well, where the Spirit of the Lord is, that's Bethel. That's the house of God. That's the presence of God. And there is freedom. So we get freedom at Bethel. We can find peace at Bethel. We can find confidence in Bethel. There's so many things that we find in our daily, secret, quiet time with God in Bethel. It's where the Lord works on us. It's where he prepares us to carry the anointing that he wants us to carry. Part of the reason that people of God don't walk in the anointing that God has for them is because they don't have a strong relationship with Bethel. A.W. Tozer said, Contentment with earthly goods, contentment, being satisfied with what we have, contentment with earthly goods is the mark of a saint. 
contentment with our spiritual state is a mark of inward blindness. I want you to think about that. I'm going to read it again. Contentment with earthly goods is the mark of a saint. Contentment with our spiritual state is a mark of inward blindness blindness he goes on to say among the many who profess the christian faith scarcely one in a thousand reveal any passionate thirst for god how often do we get those two things backwards we're content with our spiritual state so we don't pursue more and more of god so we walk in less than what he has for us to walk in but we're ill content with our earthly state, so we pursue it with everything that we have to gain more and more of what what makes us feel good in the moment, but is ultimately powerless. Going to Gilgal for separation, it will not feel good in the moment. Going to Bethel to meet with God for a time of correction will not always feel good. Bethel will not always be a pleasant experience. You'll come to love your Bethel, but it will not always be happy-go-lucky, everything's fine, pat you on the back, go get them. Sometimes God's going to bring correction in Bethel, and that's not always fun. The Bible says, no discipline seems good at the time, but it yields what? A harvest of righteousness. I'm saying that what may hurt in the moment will produce the anointing that you want to carry, but you can't pick up the cloak, you can't have the position, and you certainly can't have the anointing without first going through Bethel. I'm getting ready to close. We talked about John 15 last week when we talked about the the cutting back so that we could bear more fruit. That that whenever we go and we get separation from our flesh and separation from things that are holding us back, that God cuts those things away so we can bear more fruit. I actually want to look at John 15 again because I think that it also tells us something about Bethel. What's really interesting about John 15 is that it's just hours before Jesus is taken into custody to be tortured and crucified. He has just a few hours left, and he's telling his disciples how they're going to make it through the darkest moments of their lives. And what does he tell them? John 15, starting in verse number 1, he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, this is New King James Version, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That's what we talked about last week. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse number four says, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples." As the Father has loved me, so also have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commands, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands. And what? Abide in his love. Ten times in ten verses, ten times in that short text, Jesus tells his disciples to abide in him and let Jesus' word and Jesus abide in them. How are they going to make it through this Trial. What does Jesus say when he only has a few hours left before he's taken away from them? One of the key messages in those few chapters in John is this. Abide in me. Remain in me. Live there. That's what abide means. Live there. Live in my presence. If we want to walk in the anointing, we have to put our shoes on every day in Bethel. If we want to walk in the anointing,
We have to put our shoes on every day in Bethel. We have to put our shoes on in the presence of God, in the quiet place. I want to challenge you to make Bethel a priority no matter which season of life you're in. On the mountaintop, everything's going good. Be dedicated to going back to your Bethel. In the valley, the whole world's falling apart. Be dedicated to going back to your Bethel. No matter what season you're in, you need Bethel. Because when you're on a mountain, it's tempting. See, when you're in the valley and your, your whole life is in ruins and in ashes all around you, you run to Bethel. Oh, don't look so holy at me. The Sunday after September 11, 2001, do you know what happened in churches? They were filled up. Why? Because when devastation comes, we run to the rock. The one who's higher than we are. And we say, hide us in the cleft of the rock. We need you. I know I can't do this on my own. When life's falling down all around us, we run to Bethel. We don't have to be drugged to Bethel when everything's a mess. But when we're on the mountain and everything's going smooth, the tendency is to say, look what I did. Did you see that? I was good. I was good back there. And if you'll, if you'll go back to Bethel the next day, God will remind you, hey, I was there. You were okay, but I was the one who was good. And he'll keep you from getting too proud that that mountain that you're riding, that you fall off of it. He'll keep you from getting so proud that he can't use you anymore. If you'll keep going back to Bethel, even when you're on a mountain, in every season, go back to Bethel. I want to encourage you super practically to make your Bethel a specific place and go there at a time, a specific time every day. Again, well, where should that place be? I don't care where the place is. In your car, in your yard, in your garden. We like the back porch, on the back porch. Get a specific place with God every day. It just does something to know. When I come to this place at this time, I meet with God. Get a specific place. Go to Bethel daily. Bethel is a private place. If you can't be trusted to be faithful with your alone time with God, what makes you think that you can be faithful with a public anointing? Before you get the public anointing, you've got to get the private Bethel right. The public anointing will follow the secret place. It's all scriptural, and we could talk about it for a long time. God sees what you do. This one, this stop, more than any other stop, is secret, it's private. No one else will know if you're going to Bethel every day. People will know if you go to Gilgal. It'll be apparent in your life. When you stop doing the things that they're doing and go into the places that they're going and talking like they, the people will know that something has changed. And people, next week we're going to Jericho. That was a lot of fun. They're definitely going to know when you show up at Jericho. 
And they're going to know when you get the anointing at the Jordan River. They're going to see all of that. They're going to know all of that. All that's going to happen in public. And when you start walking in the anointing, that's going to be really public. But before you can do that, before you can wear the cloak, before you get the position and before you get the anointing, you have to get the secret place right. You got to get Bethel right. When we get the secret place right. God will give us the public anointing. Will you stand with me this morning? Lord, you're good. Wow, you're so good. God, we thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the power. Not just the commission, God, to go and make disciples. If you had just given us that commission to go and to change the world for the kingdom of God. But if you had given us no power to do it, then we would be powerless to do what you called us to do. I'm thankful for the anointing. I know that I'm going to have to change if I want to carry another level of anointing I'm going to have to go to another level at these places that we're stopping at 